We're live on you on YouTube, and I should just say welcome again to episode 62. Uh, we've been doing this for 62 weeks now, and I'm having a great time with this. And I hope uh, you know my We're goal, of course, YouTube. is for you to really take control of your overall health. And the main the main thing that I think is, as I always say, my goal is for you to become your own authority in health, and that means is that um, empowering you to be able to realize that you have the wherewithal to understand some of the concepts that will allow you to make your own decisions for yourself and learn how to really you know, decide on, on the, the decisions that you make and who, who you listen to, how to evaluate the information, and to give you a wide spectrum of hopefully interesting topics that you can um, used to sort of broaden your knowledge. So to review, last week we spoke about metabolic flexibility, which is basically the ability of your body to burning to switch between burning sugar and burning fat. And probably only 10 or 20 percent of the American population is metabolically healthy, meaning they have this metabolic flexibility to to switch easily between burning sugar and burning fat. And believe it or not, it's 80, 80 or 90% of the population is not capable of doing that. One of the easiest ways to know whether or not you are metabolically inflexible or unhealthy in a metabolic way is if you skip a meal or and you feel very, very sick, or you can't go more than you know a certain number of hours without eating anything. This is a sign of, of metabol being metabolically unhealthy. It means that your body, which normally would switch from burning sugar to burning fat in the situation of not having food, it means that your body's not capable of doing that. And when it's not capable of doing that, it becomes dependent on sugars. And when it becomes overly dependent on sugars, this there's a whole host of things that happen. happens. Uh, one of which is that you get an elevation of something called insulin. And unfortunately, this high level of insulin prevents you from breaking down your fat. Um, so in order to sort of restore this metabolic flexibility, we spoke about different fasting strategies, sometimes just slowly, um, you know, increasing the time from the last meal of the day to, to the first meal of the next day, and slowly building up this time, all kinds of fasting strategies that, that are going to help with that, as well as for some people who are, who are eating an overabundance of things that make your blood sugar spike, you know, processed carbohydrates and uh, too much, too many sugars, these sorts of processed foods, all of these are going to hinder the ability of your body to really have this healthy metabolism of burning sugar when it needs, when it, you know, burning carbohydrates, you know, um, which it does naturally, but also in the absence of food, being able to, to liberate your, use the fat in your body as a source of energy, just as evolutionarily, you know, humans would have periods of food scarcity. And when they had those uh, episodes of food scarcity, essentially they were, they were switching basically to burning from burning uh, sugar to quickly uh, to burning fat and having this efficiency of doing so is really one of those things that we really should spend time trying to recapture. And that's what we spoke about last week. And you can certainly get that, uh, uh, the recording I posted on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel. Tonight dovetails with what we spoke about last week. And it's what I'm, what I'm calling it is the metabolic theory, I sh theory of cancer. And this came about really very specifically, actually, because um, uh, as president of Miracle Noodle, I I've attended many different conferences. And over the last couple of years before, of course, before COVID, uh, there were two conferences I went to. One was a, a ketogenic uh, diet conference, and the other one was basically focused on metabolic therapies. And I met people there that really uh, opened my eyes to a new theory uh, of cancer. And I probably as a conventionally trained doctor would have been uh, somewhat resistant to, to it because it goes against the sort of mainstream thinking uh, until you know I met a few people, two people specifically who had glioblastoma, a, a type of brain tumor that is, is a, a, a terrible thing to have and is <clears throat> nearly 100% fatal. And these were people who were alive many years after their diagnosis. 
And I, it was unbelievable. They were there with their physician um, and uh, ultimately got to meet um, a, a doctor at one of the other conferences who has helped many people with, with cancers that are through, through thinking about this cancer through a metabolic um, idea, which you, which we'll get to in a moment. And seeing these patients, of course, you know, one could say, well, you know, you just saw the, 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 you know, in a, a very rare situation, you know, maybe it wasn't related to the fact that this person was, was on a ketogenic diet, uh, but talking to the physicians and the, and eventually meeting some of the main researchers in this field, I, I've really come around to, to thinking that while this may not be the end of the discussion in terms of understanding cancer and under, understanding treatments and, and such, it certainly is something that it, that pushes things forward. And so that's basically what we're going to talk about tonight. And my goal is really just to, not to, not to be comprehensive about this, because quite frankly, I can only give you an, in, the, in, the introduction as I know it. <clears throat> it's not something that I counsel patients in. And I certainly am not recommending a, a certain kind of diet. If you have cancer, you shouldn't take any of what I'm talking about tonight as, as medical guidance of any sort. Uh, but I will provide resources if this is uh, further resources for you so that if you, uh, and we all know people who have cancer or, or who had cancer, and uh, this sort of theory is important for survivors of cancer as well, uh, as, you, as you'll see as we go through, through this. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. And as always, um, you can always type into the chat box if you have any questions, and I'll be happy to hopefully be able to answer them. And if I can't, I'll tell you where you can find the answer. So I've labeled this, titled this as cancer as a metabolic disease. Uh, the prevailing theory we have in conventional medicine is, is something called the somatic mutation theory, which basically says that, that cancer is a genetic disease. Even if you go to sort of National Cancer Institute, it still says that cancer is a genetic disease. Now the theory behind, behind this type, this theory, which was, came about in the 1950s, is that you basically have nuclear mutations. So in other words, your DNA mutates. And, um, and also you have what are called tumor suppressor genes and tumor and oncogenes. In other words, genes that promote cancer and genes that suppress cancer. And essentially what, what this theory says is that the primary factor involved in cancer is some sort of genetic um, susceptibility or, or activation by a gene that you, that you actually inherit or you have these oncogenes um, in, your, in your genetic code and therefore those turn on or they get suppressed. Um, and their nuclear mutations, and that leads to a uh, tumor. If you look at the tumors in general, uh, they can identify all kinds of different genes that they've identified, and they've called them driver genes in the sense that they are, are driving the, the production of a tumor, or the, you know, the, the, the growth of a tumor. And the theory goes is that, well, you, in all, all tumors, you find genetic instability. And therefore, this also points to the fact that there is some sort of genetic issue that is going on. And when I say genetic, I'm basically not necessarily saying that you inherit it, but that it is in that it's something's going on in your in your genetic code that there's genetic instability, um, and that perhaps these mutations just arrive arise randomly during DNA replication. Now it is true, in fact, that a lot of when our DNA replicates, we have enzymes that basically are scanning your DNA for for an error uh, to take place, and then those those enzymes can go in and actually just edit out your DNA and put in the right one. And you know, a lot of people who talk about the the somatic mutation theory basically <clears throat> say, well, ultimately. You know, you get one of these things, you know, you get, you know, the, I've heard people say, you know, you, 100, you get 100 or 200 of these mutations that happen every day, but your body is perfectly capable of, of editing the DNA such that, you know, you don't get these tumors. Um, and as I said, the National Cancer Institute um, still says cancer is a genetic disease. That is, it is caused by changes to genes 
that control the way our cells function, especially how they grow and divide. So in other words, what the National Cancer Institute is saying that your genetic, something's going wrong in your DNA. And when it goes wrong, it's basically causing the cell to, to multiply and, and then you get a tumor. And this is uh, generally the, what is overriding not, not only the conventional understanding of cancer, but also because this is the prevailing idea behind how we think about cancer, it also is, is the primary motivator um, or the, I guess you could say the underlying, um, you know, intellectual construct uh, of how, how people think about treatments. In other words, if, if, you know, if we're understanding this as way cells divide or DNA is being, being um, there's some sort of DNA mutation, therefore the, they're going to be, well, they're going to look at, at, at chemotherapy that's going to change the way the cells divide, uh, or they're going to perhaps look at some kind of tumors looking at, uh, you know, the genetic side of things. In other words, when one is looking at a theory, one, when one has a theory, um, they are only going to be thinking about the that theory in when they hypothesize different treatments. And therefore, if it falls outside of this somatic mutation theory of genetics, then it's not necessarily going to be thought of as a legitimate treatment for, 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 for cancer. Uh, and so that's going to play an important role. Just a personal side, uh, we are a, a Miracle Noodle, a uh, supporter of an organization called the, um, the Concern Foundation. And they support uh, cancer research, different, various different treatments, cancer research. And I was looking through the list of, of research projects and um, there was one that I thought was related not to the not to the somatic mutation theory, but to the to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Because this one marker, it tends to go way down when someone's on a, a, a ketogenic diet. So I reached out to the researcher, uh, and uh, and I was speaking to him about my experience, both meeting patients as well as discussing this idea with. Uh, basically with, with the leading researchers in, in, in thinking about this in a different way. And it, it really is amazing, but, you know, he was so ingrained with this particular theory. And of course he has an entire lab that's built up behind this theory that he wasn't really able to even um, dialogue with me uh, in any substantial way. Uh, so that, which was somewhat, not somewhat, Frustrating, I guess. Not frustrating. I, I sort of expected it. I was hoping maybe, maybe not. But the point is, is that we all have ideas and we all have theories that we hold to be, you know, the truth. And um, and and we might have an entire career founded upon this sort of theory. And it, it's very difficult to be able to see beyond that when your entire world is focused sort of in that world. And uh, it was an unfortunate um, com series of conversations I had with him. Um, okay, now, anyway, that's just a personal side. So that's a somatic mutation theory. Now, I, I'm sure that if there was any cancer researcher listening to this, they would think that I had completely butchered that um, explanation. It was very superficial. And again, this is sort of we're just spending time tonight spent, you know, going over the, uh, just a very cursory view of, of this. Um, and it, as I said, it sort of dovetails with what we spoke about last week as we get into the metabolic theory. Okay, so now let's go into this metabolic theory that, that, we, that we've speak, been alluding to. Close this down. And it actually starts in the 1930s, believe it or not, um, by a Dr. Otto Warburg, who um, was nominated for the Nobel Prize like 30 something times, uh, won the Nobel Prize. He was a, a German, um, a German a doctor, medical doctor and researcher. And he discovered 
or observed, the cancer cells are behaving in a very uh, diff different way. Was, and this was entitled the Warburg effect. And again, this is in the 1930s. Um, and he said that cancer above all other diseases has countless secondary causes, but even for can cancer, there's only one primary cause. Summarized in a few words, the primary cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in normal body cells by a fermentation of sugar. Um, another way of saying this is that he basically reported that cancer cells are exhibiting um, increased glucose uptake, so blood sugar um, and more lactic acid production, even in the presence of oxygen, um, with cancer cells appearing to prefer aerobic glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. So uh, what this basically means for all intensive purposes is that the way the cancer cell is um, processing um, or metabolizing, I should say, things is, go is going to be different. It's essentially preferring um, and really ramping up, ramping up glucose uh, uptake. Um, and this is one of the ways they do like the pe PET scan. If many of you've heard about a PET scan, they use uh, an uptake of a type of, of sugar to be able to spot areas around the body that might have had cancer spread because of this Warburg re uh, effect. In other words, it's taking up a glucose and sugar so much so, uh, more so than the surrounding normal cells that you can identify areas of, of metastasis of, of cancer spreading by this, by this Warburg effect that it's taking up blood sugar so much. Now, why, why didn't this sort of recognition then become something that then turned into a metabolic theory back in the 1930s and 40s? Well, I actually don't really know the answer to that. There's, there's a very, uh, I should say, highly uh, anticipated book it was just released yesterday on Otto War Warburg because he was a very unusual guy. His his um, on his on his father's side, um, he was he has Jewish ancestry, and he was so brilliant that even with that, like Hitler um, kept him in uh, Germany, allowed him to stay in Germany and continue his cancer research. Um, very unusual guy. Anyway, uh, there's a supposedly as I said, a very um, incredible book that was just released yesterday about Otto Warburg. I'm unfortunately, I can't think of the name of that book, but it is something that I'm going to be reading. And it talks about this issue that, you know, here we have this theory, or at least we have the Warburg effect itself, which isn't denied. Um, but what, what, what has taken over is the somatic mutation theory. Um, and but we had sort of the first inklings of this theory based upon Dr. Otto Warburg's, uh, you know, uh, evaluation. So this leads me to, I'm going to move these down a little bit differently um, and move this up here. So next, um, I'd like to talk about what's what are called the nuclear transfer study. So we've established that, that we have a over prevailing theory called the somatic mutation theory, which basically says that something's going on with your DNA and you might have it already in your DNA and that's causing your cancer. Um, now, how do we translate the Warburg effect, this, this idea that glucose is taking things up, um, that uh, cancer cells are taking glucose up into a theory and that could potentially lead to some sort of treatment? So the first sort of, um, I should, I, <laughs> there's so many things that I want to say that I have so many uh, thoughts coming into my head. The, the One of the first things that sort of cast doubt on the somatic mutation theory is a series of studies that were done that are, are basically now referred to as nuclear transfer studies. So now, you know, we've spoken before about how you're, you have a cell and in your cell you have um, the nucleus and inside the nucleus is the DNA. So we have, and that is, so we understand that. And then we also have the mitochondria, which are floating around outside the, the nucleus. And those are the powerhouses of the cell. So it would make sense 
see if you can follow my my thinking, my explanation here. So if the theory, if the theory is that, um, um, okay, Lu Lewis is uh, saying, he looked up the name of the book. It's called Ravenous, uh, Otto Warburg and the Cancer Die Connection. And like I said, it was just released yesterday. Um, uh, I haven't ordered it uh, because I was busy today, but probably tonight I will order it. Uh, it's supposed to be a fabulously well-written book. Uh, again, Ravenous by um, Ravenous, Otto Warburg and the Cancer Diet Connection. Okay, so thank you for that. So let's follow, let's go back here and I'm gonna be very, trying to be clear and concise about this. So we have the somatic mutation theory, which says that things are going on in the nucleus, in the DNA, and that's causing cancer. So it would make sense that if I were to take the, the DNA, if I were to take the nucleus out of one cell, and put it in another cell, replacing the nucleus in that, then you would think that if, if it's a genetic disease, that that cancer would turn into a cancerous cell. Makes sense, right? If, it's, if everything's going on in the DNA and you take the nucleus out of the cell and put it in another cell, it should cause cancer. Well, that actually doesn't happen. Isn't that interesting? Um, if it were just a genetic disease, it would certainly happen because you've just taken a genetic material and put it in a different cell. But the, the point is, is that that doesn't happen. Uh, likewise, if in, in this, these particular studies, they actually looked at it from a mitochondrial perspective and they took the mitochondria from, um, from non-cancerous cells um, and, if, and they basically swapped it. So in other words, um, when they were, when they took, um, that, that when they took mitochondria, the, the opposite happened. In other words, you were able to duplicate a, and create sort of a cancer environment. So essentially further, further work was done with the cytoplasm. And it was shown that, and the cytoplasm is everything that's going on in the cell. And um, they were able to really determine that if the, nor, if, the, if the DNA was abnormal, in other words, if you had the DNA, but you had, um, you had mitochondria from non-cancerous cells, they, they suppressed the, the tumor. So, all right, so let <laughs> I me, mean, uh, I've never actually ex uh, explained it. So, so um, let me, let's do it one more time so you have a clear understanding of this. So if, if cancer is genetic and it's in the DNA, if you take the DNA and put it in another, another cell, it should turn to cancer, it doesn't. If you take the mitochondria from non-cancerous cells and put them into a, a cell that has DNA uh, that's cancerous, it actually suppresses the cancer. And same thing happens with normal cytoplasm. In other words, other things that are going on in the, the cell itself outside of the DNA can also suppress tumor growth. So this summary basically, it shows basically what happens, which is really pretty remarkable if you ask me. So the, this here is your nucleus and this is your mitochondria. So in a normal set of cells, if they divide, you get normal cells. With tumor cells, obviously, if they divide, you get two, two tumor cells. If you have a normal cytoplasm, you know, the, in other words, the area is, is completely normal, uh, but the DNA is abnormal, and though that cell divides, it actually are, is normal cells, even though it has the messengers of, of potential cancer growth in the DNA, these cells are, are normal. They, do, they are not cancerous cells, even though they might have markers of, of cancer. Likewise, if you have tumors cytoplasm, in other words, you take a, a cell that's converted itself over to being a, a tumor, but it has a normal nucleus. Um, in other words, just the changes of cancer that have happened outside the DNA, but instead it has normal uh, DNA. When the cell divides, it turns into tumor cells. So this really puts a lot of question into the genetic theory of disease because it's basically saying that there are other factors that actually control the cancer itself. And therefore it sort of leads back to, the reason it leads back to 
Otto Warburg is because there's a different type of um, respiration that goes on in the mitochondria. Um, and it's sort of been further with, with this research um, showing that no matter what is going on with the DNA, if everything else is okay, um, it's the cell's going to be okay. Now this research was even was furthered even um, more by Dr. Mina Bissell, and she has some really great lectures on on YouTube. And basically, she actually showed that in addition to the mito, in addition to the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, all those other things that we spoke about besides the nucleus, she actually showed that even um, the extracellular matrix, things outside the cells have an effect. And she, she says growth and malignant behavior are regulated at the level of tissue organization and, and tissue organization is dependent on the extracellular matrix. So she was able to go even further and show an, another entire um, other element that's completely not genetic, that's associated with what's going on outside the cell, which has led many people to think about cancer at, in what they call a terrain theory. In other words, looking at the whole terrain of the cells and not focusing on the, the, gene, the genes themselves. And this, this is what has really caused an incredible amount of excitement in people. And unfortunately, in conventional medicine, um, it's still not something that is, is accepted. There are people like Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who I had the, um, the opportunity to, to talk to for an extended period of time at one of the conferences um, at, at several times during the conference. And he, he's at Boston, I believe at Boston College and has done uh, several studies and has linked up with doctors who are brave enough to, um, to, to be part of, of looking at how can we innovate cancer treatments based on this. Now, ultimately, it comes back to metabolism. And remember, we spoke about here how these cancer cells, he reported that cancer cells exhibit high rates of glucose uptake. We spoke about that, which basically means that people are a little bit unsure why, why it's doing that. Um, some people say that when it does this, it conveys some sort of survival advantage to the cancer cell because these cancer cells are like immortal cells, right? They, they are capable of surviving that. And it could be as a, could be related to this increased glucose uptake, but what happens if we're able to reduce the glucose uptake of the cell? that's where the ketogenic diet enters in. In other words, when someone is in ketosis, there is still blood. You still have blood sugar running around your body. You'd die if you didn't, but blood sugar is much, much lower and your, your cells are using ketones, which your cancer cells can't do that. They're not capable of using ketones like your normal cells can. And therefore it's led to this theory that perhaps lowering blood sugar uh, as much as you can through the process of a ketogenic diet can have some impact on cancer. Now, back in 1909, believe it or not, there was a, a doctor who did some animal studies called Dr. Moreshi, 1909, and here's what he said. He fasted mice and showed that they had longer survival rates, tumor reductions. Um, there, there was some recommendation of, of various fasting strategies for cancer, even into the 1960s. Uh, it's been shown that, that uh, energy restriction or fasting enhances DNA repair. We've actually spoken about that when we've spoken about the fasting mimicking diet and various other fasting strategies where you get to a point where your body is, is, being, is capable of repairing itself in a much more efficient and focused way when you're in a fasted state. Um, there's less oxidative damage, and there's even a reduction in oncogenes. This, in other words, this is those genes, um, again, that we spoke about that do have play some kind of role, they're in there. Uh, the question is, is, are they expressed and how are they expressed? Um, this energy restriction, uh, fasting, in other words, reduces oncogene expression and also affects insulin, which, which we've spoken about many times before. And insulin is a growth hormone. Of course, we know it as the as something that pushes 
uh, blood sugar into the cell, but it's also a growth hormone. And therefore it makes sense that if there is a reduction in insulin through fasting or other means that perhaps there could be some uh, reduction in tumor growth and maybe some influence over gene expression as well. And this was known way back in 1909. In fact, as I've mentioned many times in many other lectures, it's been shown, fasting has been shown to be beneficial for a whole host of conditions. I remember seeing reports of um, lupus and psoriasis being treated for, with, with uh, fasting going back a hundred years. Um, remarkable things uh, that take place in fasting. And we're gonna really uh, understand that in just a moment. So brave guys like Thomas uh, Seyfried uh, are doing, doing research. And I've spoken about Dr. Walter Longo as well. Now, Dr. Walter Longo is the creator of the fasting mimicking diet. And he's, he has been uh, responsible for creating protocols for people who are about to go into cancer chemotherapy that revolve around fasting or fasting mimicking. And we're gonna uh, spend a little bit of time on that. And then we're going to talk about Dr. Nasha Winters, who is a, a naturopathic doctor who has seen thousands of patients who are using this therapy uh, for, for their cancer. So let's talk a little bit about fasting and chemotherapy. And um, so we've spoken about fasting, um, but what happens when someone is fasting and they get chemotherapy? Now, first of all, I wanna say, obviously, I'm not recommending anyone uh, fast um, with their chemotherapy unless they talk to uh, their doctor. Now, if, if there is someone who you know who is about to get chemotherapy, uh, I would reach out to, Dr. Walter Longo has an organization. Um, I, I don't know the name of it, but if you look for Dr. Walter Longo and you type in his name along with, you know, um, fasting and chemotherapy, you'll find that he has a society, as it has an organization that provides um, the medical literature to support the use of fasting around chemotherapy, you know, a couple of days before to be able to um, help with chemotherapy. Not only does it protect or reduce the side effects of chemotherapy, but it also increases the efficacy, um, the effect of, of chemotherapy. And we will understand, you'll understand why that is in just a moment. So, um, so as I said, if you know someone who is going through chemotherapy, I would reach out to the organization, Dr. Walter Longo's organization, to get uh, a copy of those reports. They're, they're made to be given to your oncologist to be able to use them um, and uh, get, get him involved in this, this type of understanding because it, it is very, the, the, the reports that have been done are, are very convincing. Uh, they're very serious research that has been done around this. Um, and it's uh, so just something that, um, that I think it's important. Okay, so um, we know fast, well, so what happens is it protects from toxicity, reinforces stress resistance, tumor cells become more sensitive to toxins, uh, calorie res restriction, they have, uh, generally speaking, there's reduced factors for cancer. In other words, people who are on calorie restricted diets, they, they have less cancer. Obviously that's not a practical thing to, to put people on because obviously, because it's not something that people are going to stick with being on a, a calorie restriction. Nonetheless, it has been shown that people who go through, who are on a, um, calorie restriction have reduced uh, incidence of, of cancer and nutrient um, deprivation <laughs> shuts, shuts down pathways, promoting growth um, to reinvest energy in maintenance and repair. <laughs> Okay, now, what does that mean? And this diagram really, really explains it well, and I hope that you can understand it. So here we've got healthy cells and we've got cancer cells. And uh, this is short-term fasting. Now, when, with short-term fasting, um, what happens? Well, you get decreased IGF-1, which we've spoken about before as this growth hormone that, um, is important to have at a reasonably low level as you get older. Um, and 
essentially what's going to happen is, as we've spoken about with fasting mimicking and all the fasting, you get maintenance and repair with fasting. You get protection. All, you know, your protection is upped. Uh, your DNA damage goes down. Your oxidative stress goes down. Um, and therefore, um, essentially with this, because of all, the, all these things going on, you're getting decreased toxicity of, of the therapy um, because of that to healthy cells, which is going to reduce the side effects of, of the treatment because your healthy cells are not going to be, um, in other words, it's almost like you're, a, you're putting a border, you know, your, your resilience of your healthy cells to the chemotherapy is, is, is enhanced, it's increased because you have decreased DNA damage, decreased oxidative stress in the presence of chemotherapy because of the activation of the, all these things, um, all of maintenance and repair and boosted protection that, that happens when you're in a fasted state. Now we already know that cancer cells need, more, need sugar. They need more nutrients than a normal cell. They have increased growth rate and they can't, they can't switch from burning sugar to burning fat. They're not capable of doing that. Remember, we spoke about that um, in uh, we spoke about that in um, in many many it, you know we spoke about that before uh, when we talked about the the Warburger effect. So what happens with short term fasting? Well, your glucose goes down, you know, your insulin goes down, and your cancer cells can't adapt to fasting. You know, they're not going to switch over and start utilizing ketones. They can't, you know, if you're fasting and you go into a keto ketosis, you're liberating um, energy from fatty acids. They're not going to be able to be used by cancer cells, but you get in healthy cells, your cells are capable of living off of a lower blood sugar. And for uh, cer certainly for the period of duration that we're talking about, these ketones and everything else that's going on is increasing the resilience to these healthy cells. Um, so, but with, with short-term fasting, there's no adaptation in cancer cells. There's persistent growth and there's no protection against stressors at all, which basically means that with chemotherapy, there's increased DNA damage, increased oxidative stress, which means you get an increased efficacy of therapy. So, um, so the Longevity Institute at USC and in Milan, uh, I believe are the ones that, that Dr. Walter Longo um, is associated with, and I believe um, they may have um, the protocols there. If for whatever reason you can't find it, please do reach out to me and I certainly can find it and, um, and uh, forward you that. Uh, one of my employees last year um, was going through cancer and um, I, I connected her with, with them. Um, oh, she downloaded the uh, information um, in this case, unfortunately, her doctor didn't, didn't follow it. But um, anyway, point is, is that there are many examples of people going through chemotherapy who are, who get very, obviously get very ill when they go through chemotherapy. And there are certainly examples of people who are doing fasting um, where they had chemo once, and then maybe the next round they did the fasting and they've shown an enormous uh, decrease in symptoms. And again, the studies show that there's increased efficacy of, of, the, of the therapy. So all of this, basically, this, these treatments that are coming about have something to do with either um, calorie restriction, fasting, or the implementation of, uh, of a specific ketogenic diet. Uh, and the reason they work again, is because of this Warburg effect where the cells are requiring all this extra type of sugar. So that's basically what the, a very, very superficial uh, overhaul of, of what this theory happens to say. Now, I was lucky enough to meet both Dr. Seyfried, Seyfried and uh, Dr. Nasha Winters. Um, and she wrote a book called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. And she's had, as I said, thousands of cancer patients that she's guided along um, using a specific ketogenic diet for, for several conditions. Now, it doesn't mean that a ketogenic diet is the end-all be-all of this, of, of this sort of thing. And uh, in fact, there are a few cancers that seem to actually get worse with a ketogenic diet. 
So I'm not suggesting by any, uh, but just a few, but I'm not suggesting by any means that we have now come up with the answer to, to cancer. I, that is not what, um, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying basically is, is that there, there certainly are holes in the somatic mutation theory that, that haven't been embraced by conventional medicine, but have been embraced by, by very, very smart and um, well-intentioned and uh, serious researchers and physicians who have implemented, um, you know, not implemented this approach to people who are going through conventional cancer therapy. It's not like these people are, you know, just saying, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to go to my oncologist. They're not saying that at all. They're just using this as, as an adjunct to, to improve their survival, as we've spoken about fasting and chemotherapy. Um, certainly the same thing goes, if you have lower blood sugar, um, you're going to have, uh, you know, the same theory basically goes. Now, Dr. Nasha Winters, who spoke, who I spoke about, um, I again had the opportunity to, to spend some time talking to at one of the conferences, was very impressed with her. And, um, and she, as I said, she wrote a book called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. And so if anyone is, um, God forbid, dealing with, with cancer, it's certainly worth a read. And um, she has what's called the terrain 10. So we spoke about this sort of terrain theory. We spoke about how it, uh, initially there were studies done to show maybe it was the mitochondria in the cell. And then others that said that it's the whole cytoplasm, all that area going on. And that, <coughs> then we had Dr. Bissell who said that outside the cell, there's all kinds of other things that are, that are Im impairing this regardless of what the genetics show. And so Dr. Nasha Winters runs her patients through these 10 things uh, that she calls the terrain 10. So uh, epige epigenetic, nutrigenomic and genetic mod modifications. So I've spoken about nutrigenomics in the past. And in fact, the company that I use for, for this um, is, is, was recommended to me by uh, Dr. Nasha Winters. In fact, I was using a different company um, and she definitely convinced me to switch companies. And the report that I get from the new company is, is much better. Uh, blood sugar balance, of course, and just, just an aside, there are certain genes here that are going to make your blood sugar go crazy. Uh, I happen to have one myself. It's, it's sometimes labeled the skinny diabetes gene. And for me, I have to be careful uh, with my family history, what my carb intake is. So there are certain genes that are going to lead you to make certain decisions about your, your overall health. There are certain genes that are going to um, make it such that a little bit of extra saturated fat is going to cause you more weight gain than it would someone else. There are all kinds of nutrigenomic things. And if you're interested in a nutrigenomic uh, test, definitely reach out to me and uh, I'll let you know. Sharon, I will, uh, Sharon is asking, is the fasting rec recommendation also associated with time of administration therapy? Is fasting recommendation also associated with time of administration of chemotherapy related to circadian rhythms? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand that question, but we will address circadian rhythms uh, in just, just a moment. So blood sugar balance, uh, looking at toxins, uh, rebalancing and balancing the microbiome, all of these things we've spoken about, haven't we? I certainly did a lecture on how to reduce your, your toxic burden. Uh, we did a whole lecture on the importance of repopulating and balancing your microbiome. Uh, we spoke uh, about the immune system and how to deal with the aging of the immune system. Uh, we did that sort of near, near mid, midway through the COVID, COVID craziness. Uh, you can go back and talk about that or, or watch that video. Uh, we've spoken about inflammation and oxidative stress at length as well, and how important it is to, to reduce that, that inflammation, uh, enhancing blood circulation while inhibiting angiogenesis and metastasis. So in this case, Certainly, there are people who have blood circulation problems. The best way, of course, is to get moving, is to walk, is to exercise, is to get that blood circulating. Uh, having annual, uh, making sure your hormones are balanced. So I've certainly spoken of, 
at length about how every year you should have a male or female hormone panel to look at things, recalibrating stress levels and, and biorhythms, in other words, circadian rhythms, uh, making sure um, I, we've spoken, I also gave you a lecture on circadian rhythms and how important it, it is that you really pay attention and how we always think of diet and exercise um, as sort of the two things that everyone says are the most important. But now really when we understand more about, about how important the circadian rhythm is, it really should be diet, exercise and circadian rhythm. That's how important the circadian rhythm is. <clears throat> and as always enhancing uh, mental and emotional wealth. So she goes through this, um, obviously, um, for the people who are treating certain cancers, uh, she'll put them on, along with other doctors who are doing this, put them on a ketogenic diet. Um, and for, because we want to uh, starve, starve the cancer. And again, this is not something that you would do with just thinking about it and, and not, not talking to someone about it. Uh, you don't just decide to go on a ketogenic diet because you know, you have cancer or you don't go on a ketogenic diet to prevent cancer or anything of the sort. Um, if God forbid there's, there's an issue with cancer, then I think obviously you, you go to your oncologist, of course, God, God forbid you need to do that. Um, and you also talk to one of the doctors that is dealing with this particular thing in this particular way so that you can get another perspective. Uh, because these, these doctors are not uh, telling you to not do treatment. What they are telling you to do though, is to get your body in a, the terrain of your body, uh, creating a situation like those, those studies we spoke about where they change everything else around the, the nucleus. And even though the DNA hasn't been changed, you've changed the terrain in such a way that makes cancer less hospitable. Um, and that was something that my conversation with that researcher it was clear that he didn't didn't quite uh, even understand what the basic theory was. So anyway, um, I, this is a, again a very superficial uh, review of of what I think to be a very exciting uh, exciting things. There are a few um, books, as we've spoken about uh, the one book by Sam Apple, um, Ravenous Otto, Otto Warburg and the Cancer Diet Connection. And then there's another one that I'm reading now. One second. So the other one uh, is called uh, Tripping Over the Truth. Is another one that goes through sort of how this uh, metabolic theory of cancer is sort of, uh, you know, as it says, overturning one of medicine's most entrenched paradigms a very well-written book as well that I, I started a, a couple of weeks ago um, that also tells a story, but this particular book released yesterday uh, is supposed to be really fabulous uh, and um, looking forward to reading that. So I hope this was interesting. Uh, it certainly hopefully introduced you to another way of, of thinking about things and honestly giving options to people who maybe are not aware of these because you're not going to hear this from conventional medicine, uh, even though really good research has been done on it. And many case reports have been written and studies have been done. Uh, unfortunately, it often takes like 10, 10 years or more before basic science and new developments make themselves from the labs to the clinical um, arena through to your doctors. And in that particular situation, unfortunately, um, it means that that delay means that people are going to not get the benefits of significant medical advances. And I think one of the most amazing things about the internet and our ability to connect is that we, as people who are trying to optimize our health, we don't have to necessarily wait for these sorts of things, and at least not to know about them. We can learn about these things um, before they take place. Because as I, as I spoke about last time, when we talk about public health recommendations, general, your, what your general doctor is going to say, what the government is going to say in terms of what, what you should be doing with your health, all these are going to just be 
the general recommendation. It, it, it's, it's like the, the definition of mediocrity, um, which is necessary when talking about public health. But when we talk about personalized health, we don't accept mediocrity um, when it comes to our overall health. We want to optimize our health so that we can contribute to our lives, uh, to contribute and you know be, you know, give of our gifts um, as fully as we possibly can uh, to make this life uh, the best one possible. And when we have our health, that makes it all the much more easy to do that. And that is my ultimate goal for, for all of you to not to accept the mediocrity of general recommendations and to push further so that you can learn some, some new things and seek out new experts and learn new things and, you know, and try to optimize your health in, in, in new ways. So I think that summarizes everything I wanted to cover. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about the, FOD, <coughs> the FODMAP diet which is a diet that is used for people with irritable bowel syndrome, people who are having a lot of gut issues. And, <clears throat> and while, um, and I think there's an, uh, a significant number of, significant percentage of the population is dealing with various and sundry, you know, uh, gut complaints. I think it's important to understand what the FODMAP diet is because it is so effective for people who have that condition. Um, and it also, is another way of sort of looking at what's going on in the gut. So it furthers your understanding of the gut in general, and hopefully it will be helpful for people who are having, having some issues with the gut, something that perhaps they could try uh, on their own. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate uh, the nice crowd that we have tonight. And um, I will see you next Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care. <laughs>